Okay, we're back. We're live with one of my favorite people ever, Claire Hannes. She's Aww. an immigration attorney. Thanks, Jay. And she is with Aloha Immigration. She's the uh, owner and uh, principal person there. Uh, she does immigration law in Hawaii. Um, she won an award from us a couple of years ago, as I recall, for being courageous and stalwart and, and, and so principled in, in developing immigration policy that works for this country. Um, and I'd like to catch up with her today. Hi, Thank Claire. you, Jay. Hi, it's really good to be back. Yeah. So let's talk about, you know, where it is, because, uh, you know, we've had various reports from the administration who we have come not to believe in pretty much anything. Um, but they're telling us about the border. They're telling us about the invasion and the caravans. And, and we see pictures of these really pathetic people uh, being forced into horrible situations. And we don't know what the government is really doing. What is the government really doing over there? Yeah, you know, I wonder what the government's really doing, too, and, and really rely on reports of advocates and allies who are down on the border, kind of, you know, living this and seeing this real time. Um, there was a situation a couple weeks ago where they had people sleeping on gravel under bridges. Um, now they're uh, setting up more tent cities. A lot of these um, facilities are very uh, difficult to get into. Um, I've heard reports from attorneys who are volunteering in these facilities that, that the, the rules and restrictions that they're under are, Jay, other than say anti-human, I don't know how to, they're not allowed to hug their clients. They're not allowed to show any kind of physical affection. And these are people, you know, women and children who are in, you know, most need of, of a hug and some Could human contact and empathy. Could there be any legitimate empathy. reason for that rule? No, no. No, I mean, it's people mean. are, it's just mean, it's just mean. People are thoroughly searched before going into these facilities. So it's lawyers. not as though, lawyers, so it's not as though they're passing off contraband to their, it's, um, it's, it's to just make things as difficult and hellish for people as possible. It sounds like Guantanamo, actually. Um, but worse, yeah. but worse, but worse. <laughs> different, well, it's, it's similar and different, right? Yeah. Tent cities, inhuman conditions, uh, lack of oversight. All around them, you know, right. it's a prison. Right, it is, it is a prison. And, um, and then at the same time, the Trump administration cutting off aid policies that are at least uh, attempting, arguably, to make conditions in those countries where people and hopefully stay. And, and there have been, I, I've read reports that in, in El Salvador, where there, there was, you know, money through the um, Agency for International Development, there have been some, some positive developments that have made communities more safer so that people don't feel like they have to flee. Um, but now he's talking about, well, he's, you know, reverse, cutting off all of, that, all of that funding and then wondering why people still come. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's so obvious. I, I have we words to, for it. But. We ought to build a better backyard. The Organization of American States, we haven't paid attention to it. We haven't done anything to make this a better oh, place no, we, south we, of the we, border. Have, we, have, we have created the crisis, and we are exacerbating it yeah. every day. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, then, and then dehumanizing um, because of, of race and class um, biases, um, the people who are trying to, to save their families. But on the other hand, you can't let everybody come in. You have to have some rules. Right. Um, and of course, the immigration law has not been reformed for a long time. Right. And reform goes right. both ways. You know, you make it more moral, but you also make it more enforceable. And, right. and then you have a real policy. Europe failed to have those policies. And Europe is, you know, is besieged with people coming from all directions and creating problems. Um, the, the, I guess he's worried, or maybe his base is worried, the same thing will happen here. It seems to me the solution is legislation, where Congress actually does something to create better immigration laws, immigration laws that are more moral, more enforceable. Of course, the problem is this president doesn't follow the law, whatever the law is. Right. He told uh, the, H the uh, Homeland Security, Kevin um, McKinnon, McKean McKean right. he told him, look, don't follow the law. Right. I'm the president. I'm telling you, okay. don't follow the law. Do right. what I say. And if you get prosecuted, I will give you a right. pardon. To me, that is impeachable right on its face. Right. And those laws that he's talking about are international law. They're domestic law regarding the rights of refugees and asylum seekers. These are not laws that we can just kind of willy-nilly change anyway. We have international obligations that we, have, uh, you know, we haven't always upheld. But the laws have always been on the books. And so, um, and what a lot of people don't, 
A lot of people think that the laws have changed a lot under Trump. And actually, in the immigration area, the laws, you know, Congress makes a lot of people need to be reminded, right? Congress makes the laws. The laws haven't changed. What have changed are the policies and the regulations, or the, the Trump administration has attempted to change the policies and regulations that, um, that, that govern how those laws are enforced. Um, for example, the latest thing that yeah, I woke up this morning and read on my news feed is that, um, and this is the, um, from the Office of the Press Secretary of the uh, White House, um, additional measures to enhance border security and restore integrity to our immigration system. Sounds great. Okay, one of the things in here is to now start charging, setting a fee for an asylum application. So, I mean, how many more times can you whack these people? Um, who are already down and, and, and beat them further down. How can I help anybody? Just mean. No, it's just, it's me, and it's just going to cre create another layer of, I mean, it's, it's, we're fighting brush fires every day, and I feel like it's, it's, it's a strategy to have us continue fighting brush fires so that we get exhausted and either stop paying attention or just give up and, and, and walk away. But um, the people who are committing to fighting this causes, the individuals and the nonprofits, you know, we're, we're not going away. We're going to continue Don't go to away, we're, Claire. we're not we're going to continue to fight them um, on a national level. We're going to continue to fight them on a local level. And um, yeah, we're tired, um, but we're also angry. And we have a lot of people who are depending on us, whose situations are far worse than ours, um, depending on us to keep up this fight. Well, one of the things we talk about here on ThinkTech is if you know if you have a problem with what this administration is doing, you should actually determine a course of action mm -hmm. for yourself, whether it's giving money, whether it's mm -hmm. doing a phone bank, um, you know, to voters in, in Ohio, mm -hmm. uh, or in this case, it raises the question about whether a lawyer who cares a lot about this would actually go to the border and represent people in those in those mm -hmm. prisons. Mm -hmm. um, is that what people are doing? Uh, how do you feel about that? That is what people are doing, and it's it's um, that's an area where I personally have not uh, been able to step up and go down to the border and help. But it's it's an area that I've I've talked to uh, other folks about trying to organize a Hawaii delegation and going down. And there are basically shifts of, so there are attorneys who are full-time there on the ground working with nonprofit organizations, but then they rely heavily on um, rotating teams or shifts of attorneys to come in for a week or two and, uh, and, and, and take over bond hearings, uh, interviewing uh, individuals. And Hawaii actually has, through uh, the law school, there were, there were two people from Hawaii who have gone to the border um, two attorneys, and um, then they came back and shared what they saw. Oh, and I think great. I think we need to have a, a much larger uh, presence because we are, in a way, in a glorious little bubble here in Hawaii, where we we do have a handful of asylum seekers who have um, who have crossed the border and then released to family members in Hawaii. But our communities, especially, you know, people from Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, are, are very small here. So again, we've we've not had to we haven't had these issues really confront us in a significant way. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that it's not happening, no. and it doesn't mean that we don't have a responsibility. And we should care about it. And yeah. we should care about it, and that and that there's nothing that we can do. And yeah, it's a little bit more effort for some of us here to get to the border to do that. But but there's support uh, on the ground for that um, in, along the Texas Arizona California border, and there are people here who who really want to help who would either go or um, would financially support maybe law students or other people to go. And I've gotten calls from many people who just say, I'm outraged at what's happening. Who I, I want to send some money to a group along the border. And so I've, I've channeled some of that mm, to organizations I know who are doing really good, good. important work there. It's a, it's a global travesty what's happening in it. Uh, you know, I, I, I feel so strongly about it. You know, the, the words on the Statue of Liberty, the, uh, the Emma Lazarus yes. poem, yep. touches me. We've come a long way from yeah. um, those yeah. words. Yeah. Um, you know, we've also seen uh, changes in, um, in, in policies um, locally in different ways as well, too, where people who knew immigrants or intending immigrants have been really impacted. And that's primarily I've seen in the delays of adjudications of um, visa processing overseas. So family members are separated longer 
Uh, also, the, uh, the, the lengthy delays in um, local processing with, um, with USCIS, U United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. And that's the agency under the Department of Homeland Security that, um, that adjudicates naturalization, green cards uh, especially, and also um, uh, immigrant petitions. So if, if you're filing a petition for a family, uh, a close family member, so where it used to be, for example, Jay, um, applying for a green card for a husband or wife here in the United States in Hawaii would take about three months start to finish. Now that's closer to 10 to 11 months. Where naturalization used to be about three months, now is closer to 9 to 11 months as well. And so, you were telling me that these, um, these hearings on, on, on um, uh, sanctuary and um, you know, the people coming across the border seeking sanctuary, um, now these hearings, and, and, and Kevin um, McLean. Mc, I have a hard McElean, time with his name McElean too. We'll, we'll, we'll probably was, be seeing so much of him. We'll get used he, to it. He made a, he made a good statement on behalf of Trump on sixty Minutes uh, this week, and you know he had us all believing that they come across uh, that they are incarcerated until they're court processed, and then they go out into the into the community without any real control, and they got to come back for a hearing. But what I didn't know is the results of these hearings are, what, mostly rejection anyway. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, that, first of all, the majority of people who are released either on their own recognizance or under bonds, and sometimes bonds. I have a client here who is, a, a, you, um, Immigration Customs Enforcement, is requiring a bond of $25,000. He's an asylum seeker, okay, $25,000 for him to be able to continue fighting his case and not live in the federal detention center by the airport. So people, um, Homeland Security is charging these very high bonds, and the majority of people are showing up for their, uh, for their, their hearings at immigration courts throughout the country. But then? But then there are some immigration judges, and you can go to, um, if you Google TRAC, I think it's out of um, Syracuse University, they, uh, keep track, tabulate the approval and denial rates from immigration, individual immigration judges across the country. And Hawaii's rates are, are, are you can look at it and you can see that, they're, that they're, they're fair. There's some approvals, some denials. But you can look at, say, the El Paso court, the Atlanta immigration court is notorious. Uh, the Lumpkin- um, They deny everything. 90 plus percent uh, Case of so denials. what's the point? That's a charade. That's a kangaroo court. It is a it? kangaroo court where, where real lives, I mean, people are being, in some cases, sent back to their, their deaths. Um, or they're continuing to fight these cases, but they're in immigration detention long term. And it's very difficult to fight a case when you're an immigration detention. And most of these people cannot afford attorneys. There are no attorney. There are no attorney. They put these detention centers in very rural, difficult to reach can't places. Can't get to them. You can't get to them. They have the courts within the detention center, and so it's um, there's there there aren't attorneys um, to do this kind of work, and there's no public defender system for the immigration courts. It's not like a criminal court. Um, people are really on. On their own, and so again, you can you can look, you know, if you have a strong asylum case, that case should be granted. But if you present that case in front of a judge in El Paso, the, your chance is is Zero more none. likely than than it's going to yeah. be denied. What, stri what strikes me is it's mean, it's pathological, <clears throat> it's intended to place every obstacle possible and load the dice in every way. For example, right. uh, he is uh, using military lawyers. He's he's sort of diverting military lawyers to serve as, I guess, immigration judges. Um, what's wrong with that picture? They didn't know anything about immigration. Right. Just, it's command influence. He's telling them what to do, and they do it in his kangaroo court yet again. Um, what an abuse of, 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 of lawyers in general, if, if you will. And immigration law is one of the most complicated areas of law. And I'm not just saying that to say, yay, I understand most of it. Um, but, it, it but that's just People who practice different areas of law will say how complicated and convoluted immigration law is. So to think that you can give someone a short training and make them an immigration judge and that they're going to do something fair, it's preposterous. It is preposterous. Uh, yeah. So much is yep. preposterous and mean. And then, you know, but, but the immigration judges are, are different. You know, they're, they're not like federal judges. They, you know, they are under the 
um, Department of Justice. So the Attorney General, you know, you know was. I remember him. Well, yeah. <laughs> Sessions and now, what's Barr. his face? Right, thank you, Barr. Um, you know, they uh, arguably kind of lackeys for the administration. So the immigration judges, those are their bosses. So they're under tremendous pressure to move cases through quickly. Um, and these are not quick, simple cases, most of them. No. And so there's and just- And people's lives are at stake. And so absolutely, many of them. absolutely. And so due process um, violations so all over. So one thing that you mentioned here, you were reading from this press release that came from none other than the White House. And it strikes me that we actually have a uh, Homeland Security Department. We have border security sub department within that. Um, and so these, these communications should be coming from the department in the government, which is you know, uh, uh, interested in the, in the policy and enforcing the policy. Instead, they're coming from him, the right. Trump. Right. So it really bothers me that we're getting all this hand-me-down about all these details that he's creating policy. He's crowning his policy on this department and every department, and he is one mean bugger. And so what we see here is the White House controlling everything, despite what uh, either uh, Kevin McLean right. says or right. anyone else. Right. Yeah. right, and just sowing chaos, yeah. right? Where, you know, who knows who knew about this before it was, it was handed right. down. Right. But then everybody's sure scrambling this morning. Right. And so How again, he's, you know, they've it? got us, you know, kind of running, uh, running in circles. And again, we've got, um, you know, tremendous, um, advocacy from the ACLU um, locally and nationally and other organizations that um, you had last week on your show, um, Maria Elena um, from the National Immigration Law Center. Hikapie, yes, I struggled with her last name. I think I've got it now. Um, but she was fabulous and, and again, fierce, um, fierce, bright, um, thankfully well-funded, I think, advocates um, all over the country who are, um, you know, thanks to, you know, the generosity of people who um, think that this is outrageous, they want to help in some way, so they're, they're channeling their resources to these organizations that are fighting these battles. And they're winning. They, yeah. are, they are winning. But it's, Good. you know, but it's just like, oh, you know, there's so many other battles we that we should do. There's I know. so many other things we have to do. It's that... just brush fires everywhere. Yeah. Um, and we're just trying to um, not get too far behind. Yeah. Let's take a short break. I'm getting emotional. <laughs> That's Claire Hennis. She's an immigration attorney here in Hawaii today. Eh? And we'll come back and discuss the larger picture about this and uh, you know, the triangle in Central America. And we'll discuss what the government could do if it was right thinking. That's a hypothetical. We'll be right back. Aloha. I'm Cynthia Sinclair. And I'm Tim Apicella. We are hosts here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks, Thanks so much. So much. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we wanna teach you about those things in our industry that you know may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Okay, we're talking with Claire Hannes, uh, who's a very busy lady as an immigration lawyer these days, um, but busy, busy doing the right thing. So um, Trump has a history in immigration. It may affect his thinking here. One is, uh, I, mean, I think he's racist, and that affects his thinking for sure. Everybody south of the border is somebody on the wrong side of the scale for him. Uh, white supremacy above all. Right. Uber, right. Uber right. Alice, I right. think, is the term. Right. Um, but he has a, his own family history in immigration, uh, not just his wife. Oh, the irony is so thick. It just, it, it, yeah, right. His, so his, his grandfather, you know, came from Germany, 
and um, established um, bars and brothels and made a, a fair bit of money. Um, went back to Germany and got into trouble because he had um, not gone into the draft during the years that he, you know, he, he was in the United States. And so he, he missed out in his military service, like his grandson, Donald J., right? And so he. Bone spurs, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, right, right. Um, and so his grandfather was actually um, deported from Germany. And this was, it was published, I think, in Harper's Magazine this month. Um, his grandfather's letter to the government um, basically begging to be able to stay with his mother in his home country. It's really emotional. And they said, uh-uh. And they sent him back to the United States. And then his legacy is, we know, right? So, um, I mean, and then, and then, of course, his wife and, well, wives and their immigration histories through marriage to him. And then his right. wife bringing in her parents, which, it was a, which is a, um, a family-based immigration category that he would like to have cut off for everybody else. So my wife was able to petition and bring her parents, but, you other but he doesn't, no, he doesn't want, and, and, and Steve Miller, you know, who's the architect? Trump isn't smart enough to be the architect of things like, you know, these, uh, but House Stephen Memo. Miller and, and those other folks are, and so, yeah, I, it's... Well, you we talked before the show about how all these things, you know, sort of stain the United States and, yeah. and help in its global decline, yep. morally yep. and otherwise, and, and the question is whether we can, you know, fix it up somehow after he's gone, hopefully soon. Um, and, and that includes, I, I say that to include um, the kind of terrible trouble that he's making for every visitor who comes here. Every visa, every entry into the right. United States right. is met with a similar uh, rejection kind of, you know, don't send me your tired, huddled masses. Don't send me anybody. Right. Um, right. And so this is, we're closing the gates. We're going isolationist. And it is reflected in the, in the immigration uh, procedure, not the law, right. because he can't change the law. Congress would never go along with him. Correct. He'd never Correct. get it word one on that, so he has to do it by, by way of twisting, you know, the interpretation, the regulations, and, and violating the law, for that matter, right. and telling people they can have pardons if they join him in the violation. Right. But, but I would like to look, look forward, look to the end of him, whenever hopefully he ends soon, uh, and see how we can fix this up. To make immigration law right, what, what do you think we, we should do about, for example, um, you know, the, the triangle in Central right. America? Right. What do you think about reform in general? What do right. we do? What do you think we do with, the, with Homeland Security and the Border Patrol? What do we do to make them, oh, I don't know, good American caring people? Well, and, and, and there, are, there are people in, in Border Patrol, and there are some here uh, in Customs and Border Protection who are, are good and caring people, and not everyone who chooses that profession. We have some really awesome um, ICE officers Great here. Great to that. Great so, to that. Um, so they're not all, you know, stone-hearted They must um, have a big people. problem under this administration. Yeah, I think, I think it's really hard for them, and I think this, this administration has definitely you know, probably recruited a lot of people who um, have also a very anti-immigrant sentiment. And those are, you know, so we hear, you know, lots of cases of violence perpetuated by Customs and Border Protection officials um, and Border Patrol along the border. Um, as far as, as far as kind of looking forward and trying to undo some of the damage, um, Look, I think, uh, you know, a goal really needs to be for not only for humanitarian purposes, but also kind of our own interests, um, working to support um, governments in, um, you know, from Mexico on down that respect human rights that are our are, are, are democratic governments. And historically, that is not what the United States has done. The United States has propped up dictator after dictator because it served U.S. business interests. And now it's really the chickens are coming home to roost because those countries are in shambles. People can't live there anymore, and they're um, and they're escaping. And also, and, and climate change—it's an environmental issue um, as well. As um, it is in Europe. Absolutely, we have climate refugees coming from um, coming to Hawaii from the Pacific, coming to the United States from uh, from Central America too, because these 
you know, these crops are, are, are drying up. There are these long droughts. People can't, um, cannot feed their families, and they will do what they need to do to get to a place where they, where they can do that. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's a, that's a long-term plan, but it needs to start, it needs to start you know, yesterday. Um, so we've got a lot of um, catch-up and kind of damage control to do in that area. Um, as, far as, international, as far as immigration law, you know, we need to respect um, the international laws and treaties that we've signed to protect the rights of immigrants and refugees. And we need to give people a fair hearing. And, uh, and if they meet the, the standards that have been set under international law, they, they need to be able to stay in the United States and, and have refuge. And if they don't, um, then they need to go back. And that's... It's okay. not complicated. But, you know, one of the, one of the things, I mean, I, I know there are people in this country, maybe, you know, his base, that don't want anybody. They want to close it all down. Right. That's, that's right. their view of the 21st right. century. Close it all down and, and forget about, you know, American leadership. Lose right. it. We're losing it now, I'm sorry to say. Um, so what do you say to them about the, the need of the United States to have immigrants uh, for right. labor or, you know, for moving ahead for right. the generations yet unborn, uh, for making this country, may I say, great again? <laughs> I, yeah. I, I use it in a different yeah, context. Right, right, right. Well, look, I, I don't think there's a, any good economic arguments for closed borders. I mean, we're in a global, in a global economy, in a global society. Um, it's uh, folly to think that we can um, close ourselves off and that we can um, have a robust economic system. I, I can't think of any economist who would, who would make that argument. Um, additionally, uh, I think people need to reflect back on their own immigrant histories. And other than the few indigenous people that we have left in the United States, Everybody has a story, and most of those stories are not people who are coming because they had a lot of money and they just decided to kind of on a whim fly over or travel first class to the United States, and it was so great they decided to stay. Most of our immigrant histories have to do with people who were fleeing uh, severe hardship for different reasons and were coming for a better life. That's definitely the story of my great-grandparents and mine. It's a story of almost everybody's. And people are just so, I don't know how, in such a short period of time, people forget that or just or aren't taught that. We need to teach it to our children. We need to teach our children that they did not, um, it, you know, that, that their entitlements are because of sacrifices that people made before them and not that long ago. And um, try to, again, but yeah, how do you, you know, to, to his base, how do you reach them? I don't know, Jay. I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they're, how reachable they are. But we have to keep trying, and we have to not close down the, uh, the walls of communication. And when I meet someone who is a Trump supporter, I don't, uh, I don't turn the other way. I try, to, I try to figure out what is it in them that made it. Th I mean, I am the way I am because of my parents, because of my grandparents. They are the way they are because of something that shaped them to get to that point. And I'm really curious about, about what that is. I don't know if I have a whole lot of hope for changing it, but I think dialogue and keeping that dialogue open, no matter how difficult it is, and I might have bubbles over my head saying, you know, other choice words as I'm listening to them speak, but I think it's important to just to engage, to try to understand. Looking, looking over the horizon on yep. this, I'm reminded of Ai Weiwei's movie called Human Flow, mm. where he reports to us there are 65 million people now yeah. in camps around the world yeah. and growing all the time. Yeah. And their lives are really awful in those camps. They live, they die, they get sick, they don't learn anything. They're just behind barbed wire, so yeah. many people. Yeah. Um, this is a stain on all of humanity yeah. that we let this happen. But in the future, the inexorable flow of humans is going to be reducing borders. It's going to be one great big world where people are free to go where they want. And we all are responsible. Every nation as it exists is responsible for every other nation. We care, we should be caring about our fellow human beings wherever they are and uh, making, yeah. making the world um, one caring planet.
I know it's a long way in the future, and it seems very long under this administration, but I think that's inevitable to happen, uh, given our transportation, communication, um, you know, our ability to connect. Yeah, and we need to, we need to um, bring human rights, the, the issues of human rights, out from like, the corner where it's been tucked away um, for the last, well, definitely under Trump and Obama, too, to some extent. Um, and, and, and bring that back out into the foreground and look at countries, um, look at countries like China, countries that are, look at countries like the Philippines. And what are, what are our individual responsibilities? What can we do for our, our brothers and sisters who are victims of horrible human rights violations um, in those countries, in, in the Americas, uh, in, in Mexico, um, in our own country, right? I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not always just someplace else, it's here too. And, and work together to, um, to revitalize groups like Amnesty International that are educating um, about international human rights and, um, and trying to um, make people see that on a fundamental level, um, if there is oppression that's done to you, if there's an injustice done to you, it affects me too. And we're all responsible for that. And if we had seen that responsibility in the 30s, we would have stopped yeah, Hitler. Yeah. And we should see it now. We should, we should go beyond just serving as counsel for immigrants. We should, we should do something every day to, to improve the human flow in the world. Right. One thing that Marielena um, Picapier said last week, um, meeting a, a group of um, local business leaders, is that now is not the time to remain on the sidelines, to remain silent. If there was ever a time in, in, in our recent history um, to, to get up and take a stand, it is now. Um, and, and, and people's silence and, and people's um, complicity is a big part of the problem. It's a big part of why um, a person like Donald Trump feels that he can um, make these outrageous um, policy initiatives every day um, that are causing real harm and real hardship to our sisters and brothers. Uh, in a sense, we're all immigration lawyers, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> we all need to. Well, we all need to be. Uh, we all need to be advocates for yeah. um, for immigrants, for uh, for any any Im individual or group of people um, who is um, suffering right now. Yeah. Claire Hannes, one of my favorite people. Thank you, Jay. Immigration lawyer, are extraordinaire. Thank you so much for coming down. Thank you, my pleasure. Aloha, aloha, immigration. <laughs>